I'm Howard Green. Tonight, my co-host Jeffrey Rayport talks with venture capitalist Liz Beyer. Beyer gained fame in the late 90s as an internet analyst with Credit Suisse First Boston. Today, she's a VC with the firm Technology Partners. When Beyer looks back at the dot-com boom, she says it was bound to happen. Millions of traders and analysts pumping up red-hot dot-coms. Billions of dollars inflating the market. Waves of investors clamoring to get in. A mania. And it ended with a bang. The last couple of years, it wasn't that hard. Pretty much anything you invested in, you could turn in 6, 8, 12, 18 months and do just fine. Now it's going back to having to pick out the winners and the losers and actually, you know, put in the sweat equity to help build them. So while some see disaster in all the red ink being spilled on Wall Street, Liz Beyer sees opportunity. In a moment, she tells Jeffrey Rayport why. Liz Beyer, welcome. Well, oh, thank you very much. Nice to be here. You, when we last talked, were a star analyst at CSFB, working for an investment bank based in New York and in Europe, so, situated in Silicon Valley. Now you're a venture capitalist. Out of the frying pan, into the fire. It must be a very different existence, is it? It's a very different existence. It's one that's not completely unfamiliar because before I had been a sell-side analyst, I'd been an investor. And at, at, with, I was with T. Rowe Price, and we were actually putting money to work. The job of the sell-side analyst is to tell other people how to put money to work, which is very satisfying for some, but not where I was happiest. So I was in the right job at the right time. It was terrific to be the internet analyst from 97 to 2000, but time to go back to the, to the real effort, in my opinion, of putting money to work and helping it grow. How did your particular venture capital firm, Technology Partners, become the one that Liz Beyer chose to go to? You must have had 13 job offers every single day on your desk of all kinds, including VC offers. Why this? For a while, I thought I wanted to go work for a company. Let me go find one of these internet companies and see if I can take the things that I've learned in the last 15 years of being an analyst to, to help a company grow better and not necessarily reinvent the wheel. And the more I looked at single company opportunities, the more I realized that having been an analyst that long, I probably had ADD. Just wasn't capable of that kind of focus on one company all the time. So it was either take Ritalin to deal with your attention <laughs> deficit disorder or actually go to another job where you could look at countless opportunities. Exactly, exactly. So I decided that the real opportunity perhaps was, was in the middle. As a sell side analyst, you look at an entire industry. As someone working for a single company, you look at that company. VCs are in the middle. Technology Partners is a very different sort of VC firm. Each partner will do two or maybe three deals a year, and that's it. And then the object of the game is to be completely involved with the portfolio company to help in any way that we can. And that's, that's significantly different from a number of the firms that are now raising billion and $2 billion funds that are much more almost mutual funds of privately held securities. How do you deal with managing, you and your partners, a winnowing process where if you're like any other venture capital firm out here in Silicon Valley, you're seeing thousands of business plans a month, 10,000 a year, and you're talking about getting down to two or three deals per partner. You know, I, in the first few months of this new job, people have said, what's your, uh, what's your first impression? And the answer is, I'm overwhelmed by the optimism of the human spirit. <laughs> Everybody's got a business plan, and everybody thinks it will grow to be the next you know, multi-billion dollar whatever, and good for them. Optimism is, is a wonderful thing. So part of it is just reading as many executive summaries as possible and immediately winnowing out what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. Because it's only two or three deals a year, it not only has to be an interesting deal with an int with a tremendous potential and some sort of sustainable advantage, it also has to be something that I can get, for lack of a better word, passionate about. If it's just two deals or just three deals, I really want to care. And that's, that makes the winnowing process much easier because there are a number of really interesting opportunities out there that will make someone else more excited than me. So, uh, gosh, supply chain management will be, you know, obviously is doing terrific things for the economy. Great, let someone else fund those. And perhaps other partners within technology partners will do that. But those aren't the areas that are of greatest interest to me at the moment. So what are your first couple deals? So, well, again, first couple deals haven't been there that long, haven't done them yet. Um, I can tell you that I've narrowed down most of what I'm looking at to a couple of areas. One is the entertainment arena. What has Napster really proven? It's that people want entertainment served up a different way than it is today. So I'm looking at all kinds of folks in the entertainment space. Some of those who are producing content, although I think that's actually going to be a little bit further down the road. But in the meantime, the infrastructure plays. How are we going to get this stuff 
over the pipes. So I've been looking at a bunch of compression companies, for instance. Who's got a better solution as to how to take a big, fat video file and make it move not only over the, the infrastructure we have today, but what we might have in five or six or seven years. That's kind of interesting. I'm tremendously interested in the music space, having been fortunate enough to work with companies like mp3.com in their pre-public days. I think you know, clearly they're onto something. There are some kinks in the models that need, need to be worked out, but, but that's a really interesting area. I also am really interested in the consumer service area. And as everyone is like, Ugh, we hate B2C, that's fine. Let everyone hate consumer businesses. I happen to believe that some of them will turn into compelling opportunities. So when everyone else is looking at whatever today's buzzwords are, when we look at the stuff no one cares about anymore. The last time you and I had a chance to talk, we talked a lot about internet business models. And you have helped the broader community, not just financial, but the whole new economy, understand both the diversity of those business models and which ones made sense. Do you have a different perspective on what it means to separate the wheat from the chaff among internet business models today? You know, in hindsight, I guess everyone is probably saying this now, but I'm feeling sort of good about having been the curmudgeon for a while. Clearly, you know, we were in a period of time when all kinds of businesses were funded, which is great, and a bunch of them went public and did tremendously well, but some of them just never made sense. And of course, in the middle of the fury, it's tough to say that. But fundamentally, you know, what, what makes a good business model? How about a product or service that somebody really needs as a starting point? And how about something that is a sustainable, differentiating feature of a company? And then, you know, if you're going to be advertising supported, that's great. I think there is room for advertising supported companies. But you better be able to not only explain but show the advertisers why their return really is better than it would be with some other choice. Because the overall pool of advertising dollars just isn't growing that fast. It's just the allocation as to what goes to radio and what goes to television. So don't tell me you're going to give me superior returns. Show me. Um, so I'm interested in companies that, again, are it's, it's not, you know, f uh, if you build it, they will come. It's find a need and fill it. And if you are truly filling a need, people will pay you for that product. One of the things that I look at when the companies that come in is, you know, yes, show me what you think your model is going to be. But of course, no one really knows. But I want to understand that the entrepreneurs, I want to be convinced that the entrepreneurs have really thought about the model and understand where their costs are going to come from. And also what specific kinds of value they create for what specific markets who are willing to pay the money. Absolutely. You know, people think that nobody will pay anybody for content. And one of the things that we've heard about today is the Wall Street Journal now has 500,000 people, you know, paying for that subscription service. Now, 500,000 in, you know, in the scheme of Yahoo's hits is nothing. On the other hand, it says that people will pay for that content. And the CPMs that the Wall Street Journal is generating, the, the advertising dollars that's generating are huge relative to many sites. So it'll take a while, but some of the models that we're all poo-pooing today will probably work out. One of the nice things about this current period of time is that the things that we all thought were true before, that we all had to question over the last three years, a lot of them are turning out to be true after all. Common sense has not. You know, we don't have to abandon common sense. If it doesn't make sense, it's probably because it doesn't make sense.